London Airport a January morning, and the flag of A.K. Stevenson signals the London start of the 35th Monte Carlo Rally. The Rover 2000 of Costello and Cooper is one of the two rovers among 39 entrants which here begin their trek to Monte. From Oslo to Athens, at nine starting points all over Europe, more than 200 other entries prepare to meet the challenge of the oldest and justly the most famous rally of them all. At Reims, Anne Hall and co-driver Pat Spencer still have the time to check the route before their evening starts. Competition foreman Tony Cox does a final check with Jeff Mabs on one of the three rovers starting here. Thumbs up, and shortly after 10.30, the last of the nine separate sections of the first stage of the rally has begun. For drivers Morrison and Sire, a preliminary taste of the official scrutiny and publicity spotlight that will follow them for five grueling days and nights. Close behind, Mabs and Porter. Experienced drivers, confident of their car and their ability, yet not immune to the sense of occasion which only French crowds, cameramen and a lady driver can inspire. Tony Fall having his first works drive in an MGB. The London starters enjoyed a less glamorous send-off. Heavy snowfalls and bitter cold presented an immediate test of driving skill. A useful foretaste of the hazards and conditions which were to come. At the port itself, the cars regroup in orderly formation. Casualties so far are nil, but the checks by each crew are nevertheless meticulous. Michael Frostick and Maxwell Boyd, the second rover team from the London start. For all the crews, the channel crossing is a welcome respite. A chance to relax after an unexpectedly demanding run from London and a time for last-minute planning for the course to come. To everyone's relief, snowfalls in northern France had been light. But as the London starters raced inland from Boulogne to link up with the route from Reims, conditions worsened rapidly. The preliminary route, considered by many as an easy-going run-in before the tougher trials at Monte, suddenly became difficult and dangerous. Starters from Reims found conditions unimproved when they followed, now just over an hour behind. And already the twin factors of time and weather were taking their toll. For Morrison and Sire, a caved-in boot. And at a service stop, Mabs and Porter fit studded tires to grip the ever-deepening snow. Morrison's accident had cost a complete rear wing. But as the panels on the Rover 2000 are detachable, the car was able to continue unimpeded. No trouble so far for Anne Hall, though later, an accident near Chambéry would cost her dear. As the cars move out towards Monte Carlo in the quickly gathering dusk, it's still anybody's rally. With the dawn comes relief for night-tired eyes, and a peaceful prelude of the hard day's driving that lies ahead. By now, cars from Lisbon are converging on the route through central France to Monte Carlo. And this French entered Porsche began its trip at Monte. With more than 600 kilometers to go, there can be no respite for tired drivers and overworked engines. But the placid provincial towns of the Massif Central, who've seen it all before, remain unimpressed. <laughs> Almost as busy as the rally cars themselves, the Rover service vehicles dash from point to point. 
It's on these straightforward yet strenuous stretches of the rally, almost as much as on the tougher mountain circuits, that manufacturers get from their cars hard road experience upon which current innovations can be vindicated and future developments planned. For far better than any test track, rally conditions push cars up to and beyond their limits, imposing relentless pressure under the twin demands of time and competition. but unbroken, Morrison and Sire begin the final run to Monte with time still in hand. In fact, for all the cars, the easier conditions of southern France and the rather generous schedule of this preliminary stage mean that as they reach the checkpoint at Avignon, the pressure can be eased. For road-weary nerves and cramped, tired muscles, a welcome relaxation. It's fairly easy, the road from Avignon to Monte Carlo, which leads to the end of the rally's first stage. But even so, of the 192 cars which started, only 150 qualified for the stiffer test to come. The 900-mile parkour command. The next morning, they started on the roads that would take them from Monaco to Chambéry and back again within 24 hours. A classic twisting route of snow and ice divided into 14 stages including five special sections, flat out and against the clock, with the fastest man scoring fewest penalty points. There could hardly be a greater test for car or driver than these treacherous roads. And disdainful of the weather, the Rover 2000 of Morrison and Sire held its own on the slippery snowbound slopes. On this vastly more difficult section of the rally, the towns through which it passed were more alive to the excitement of it all. The rowdy arrivals of successive cars were head-turning highlights, each one an occasion. Really heavy snow soon took its toll. The Italians Fabaloli and Volpi got round the mountains, but missed a time control and were disqualified. And they weren't the only ones. It is in these conditions that the smaller cars can claim advantages. But the strain is still immense. Raymond Baxter and Jack Scott lost 18 minutes on this section of the rally. Skill, luck, stamina, and a length of elastic kept Cooper and Costello out of trouble and in the race. Not so fortunate were journalists Frostick and Boyd following behind. Eventually, they accumulated an hour's lateness and were disqualified. Melted by the sun, the snow slowly disappeared, but black ice kept the roads perilous. On the open road, the rally reverted to a race against the clock. A struggle to maintain the needed 60 kilometers an hour average eroded by the mountains and the snow. Gabrielle Renault and her co-driver came through to qualify, despite the loss of two wings at a cost of 30 penalty points. As cars began the descent that would take them to Monte for the second time, the complete character of the rally had changed. Only the well-known regular rallyists remained. The fair weather merchants and also rands had given it best and were headed southwards on less demanding roads at less hair-raising speeds. The Porsche, Boucher and Schlesser and the Nielsen's badly buckled Volvo 
would be among the 60 who would qualify for the final and formidable Épreuve Complementaire. First to Monty on this and the final stage, the mini of Timo Mackinen and Paul Easter. With the car surviving virtually unscathed, this was unquestionably the fastest combination of the rally. In third place in the overall results of the parkour commun, the Ford Cortina of Sweden's Bol Jungfeld. The Nielsen's privately entered Volvo continued the rally despite crippling damage. Of the 157 cars that set out, 88 returned. Of these, only 60 qualified for the Épreuve Complementaire, a punishing mountain circuit famous as the fighting climax to the rally. Drivers have a day and night to recuperate before they start again, but the cars themselves cannot be serviced or repaired until the rally recommences. For Michael Frostig and Maxwell Boyd, the rally is already over. But as motoring journalists both, there's still plenty of work to do. For many drivers, Rano Altonen and Timo Mackinen, the first inklings of the massive disappointment that was to come. But 36 hours later, controversy is for the moment forgotten. And the rover of Mabs and Porter is ready to face the final terrible challenge of the mountain circuit. For television and the press, just as much for the teams themselves, all that's gone before can be dismissed as mere preliminaries. The end of the Monte Carlo rally has begun. More than ever, time is important. In the freezing cold, tension rises at the control points along the circuit. Pushed almost beyond endurance, men and machines struggle to meet punishing deadlines. The desperate efficiency of mechanics, the impatient despair of drivers, and the rally is relentlessly resumed. Next morning, battle-stained and weary, they were back. Three minis and a Lotus Cortina head of the field. But through a much disputed technicality, they were disqualified. For previous Monte Carlo winner, Paddy Hopkirk and his team, a bitter disappointment. Although Zazada's car finished comfortably, it was Jeff Mabs and Jim Porter who won for Rovers 10th place in the revised results and the distinction of being the first British car home. A further credit to Rover's long list of achievements in the toughest motor rallies of the world. Thank you.